Love Story was a popular 1970 movie which was nominated for seven Academy Awards. Its theme is two young university students in love. Sadly, the real impact on society of this Hollywood offering was lost on the general public. Jennifer Cavallari, played by Ally McGraw, introduced young people to what was a new concept. She called her father by his first name, blurring the difference between parents and children, demonstrating a lack of deference and respect that continues to this day among some. There was another problem with Love Story. The most famous line in it is when Jennifer says to Oliver Barrett, played by Ryan O'Neill, Love means you never have to say you're sorry. Thankfully, most sound-minded people understand how ludicrous this assertion is, and that cliché died a speedy and merciful death. Love only flourishes within defining boundaries, and Oliver and Jennifer broke the most basic of all. They slept together before marriage a practice that is now commonplace in relationships in Western nations as couples couple and decouple at will. The result is more often than not betrayal, sexually transmitted diseases, and children caught in the middle of custody battles. Should we not ask the question, are these the fruits of genuine love? Love Story can't take all the blame for societal ills. But it's one example of Hollywood's influence on the unraveling moral fabric of our Western cultures. On today's program, I'm asking a very simple question. What is the greatest love? Is it a feeling? Is it something that happens to us? I'll be back with some surprising answers, so don't go away. Welcome to Tomorrow's World, where today I'm asking and answering the question, what is the greatest love? It's hard to dispute the fact that Whitney Houston had one of the greatest voices of our time. Few can approach the vocal clarity and power she possessed. But this beautiful woman's life story was one of tragedy, and it ended early as with so many other pop stars. One of Whitney Houston's biggest hits was The Greatest Love of All. She didn't write it, and she wasn't the first to record it, but I suggest that no one did it better. Here are the lyrics that answer the question of the title. The greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Such an assertion certainly fits the modern cliché, you can't love someone else until you first love yourself. We've all heard that and maybe repeated it, but is it true? Does it stand up to the facts? The last verse in the song is telling. And if by chance that special place that you've been dreaming of lead you to a lonely place, find your strength in love. In other words, it hints of a lonely life, and if the greatest love of all is loving yourself, that will be the result. And that is what we see, a lot of self-loving, lonely people. We often speak of a mother's love brotherly love, and marital love. These are different kinds of love, yet all share the same foundation. Many people equate love with an emotion. I once did. When I was a teenager, I thought I was in love with Becky, and then in order, Susan, Judy, Pamela, and Sandy. I knew I was in love because it felt wonderful to be around them. My heartbeat increased. I even lost my appetite for a time. Sandy and I talked about sharing our lives and growing old together. But now that old is a reality, the old part doesn't seem nearly so romantic. And as it turned out, it's Carol that I married and with whom I've shared the last 48 plus years. How thankful I am for the wonderful wife God gave me. But again, what is love? Is it a rapid heartbeat, sweaty hands, a loss of appetite? It may seem silly to ask the question, but a lot of heartache exists in this world because people don't know the answer. I once saw a young lady at Hong Kong's Ocean Park wearing a t-shirt that read, Love doesn't need a teacher. We might ask in response, if love doesn't need a teacher, why is it that so many people start out in love 
and end up in bitter disputes and angry accusations. Sometimes violent outbursts lead to mental, emotional, and even physical pain. Worse yet, domestic disputes occasionally spill over where children, family members, and random strangers become victims of deadly violence. Maybe it's time to revisit this subject of love, re-evaluate its definition, and ask where it comes from. Music tells us a lot about our culture. Frank Sinatra declared famously, I did it my way. And Whitney Houston instructed us, I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadow. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I lived as I believe. Sinatra, Houston, and the young lady's t-shirt declaring love doesn't need a teacher are wrong. Love doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come from a find-your-own-way approach. It must be taught, it must be learned, and it must be practiced. But where do we go to learn about love? Many would be surprised to know that true love is defined in detail in an ancient source that is in opposition to our pop culture. And that same source reveals what is the greatest love of all. Before the break, I mentioned an ancient source that explains what pop culture fails to understand. One chapter in that book is known as the love chapter because it lists actions that define love. Love is very patient and kind, never jealous or envious, never boastful or proud, never haughty or selfish or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable or touchy. It does not hold grudges and will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. If you love someone, you will be loyal to him no matter what the cost. This quotation is a paraphrase of verses 4 through 7. Here we see that love is defined by actions rather than feelings. It's outward, not inward the opposite of the greatest love of all lyrics. While emotion may accompany some aspects of love, the Bible explains that love is defined by the way we treat and react to others. It's not how we feel, but what we do. It's never self-centered. Love is outgoing concern and it requires action. The Bible is a book of love. A lawyer once asked Jesus which is the greatest commandment in the law, and Jesus replied, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Love must be directed first toward our Creator then toward our fellow man. But how do we show love to God? Is it by having warm feelings toward Him? The answer is not what many churchgoers think. The Bible gives us the answer so that you don't have to be in the dark. Here's what Jesus said in John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. He says further in verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. This should not be difficult to understand. If you have a child, you expect that child that you brought into this world to obey you because you have more experience and you want him to avoid behaviors that will hurt him. It's the same with God. He created us. He knows what is best for us. He loves us and gives us commandments because he wants us to be happy. When we obey Him, we show respect and love toward Him, just as a child shows respect and love toward his parents when he obeys them. This is why in 1 John 5, verse 3, that the Apostle John confirms what Jesus taught him. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. It is evident that loving God is not an inward feeling, but outward actions. When we analyze the first four of the Ten Commandments, we see God requires from us loyalty and respect. Here they are in abbreviated and paraphrased form. 
You shall have no other gods before your Creator. You shall not make any graven images in the worship of God. You shall not take God's name lightly. Remember to set aside the seventh day for rest and worship. The last six commandments teach us the minimum requirements of loving our neighbors. Notice that not one focuses on warm, fuzzy feelings. All relate to how we treat others, beginning with our parents. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet what belongs to your neighbor. Before the break, I told you I would reveal to you the promise contained in the fifth commandment. It's almost universally overlooked, but the Apostle Paul reveals it in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Those who honor and obey parents generally do live longer. They don't get caught up in activities such as the use of harmful recreational drugs which damage and shorten lives. They avoid unsavory characters which lead them into trouble. In short, they learn valuable lessons from their parents and other influential elders that keep them from life-threatening situations. There are exceptions, and although we don't always understand immediately, time usually brings clarity to the question of why. The Bible shows us that in addition to honoring parents, younger people must be taught to respect elders in general. And again, love is shown by action, an action that reminds us to respect the aged. It's found in Leviticus, the 19th chapter, and verse 32. You shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man, and fear your God, I am the Lord. This simple act of standing up when an older person first comes into the room is a gentle reminder. It's a form of constant instruction, a thought-provoking custom to practice throughout our lives toward those who are significantly older than we are. There's wisdom with age, and any society that practices such customs is wiser and richer for doing so. Pop culture promotes self-love, but our Creator instructs us that true love is directed away from the self and toward others. Do we not all agree that any society would be better off for keeping these basic commands? Who doesn't appreciate a neighbor that he can trust not to steal from him, lie to him, and commit adultery with his wife. We are by nature self-centered, and it's only through careful and diligent training that we learn to think of others. This is true whether it's about marital love, brotherly love, or the love of God. In the opening chapters of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, we learn of the first murder when Cain killed his brother Abel. When Cain was confronted as to where his brother was, Cain replied, Am I my brother's keeper? Few understand the magnitude of this question. In reality, the remainder of the Bible gives us the answer. Yes, we are to be our brother's keeper. We are to care for our brother, sister, neighbor, all with whom we come in contact. Is this not the message found in Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan? This is perhaps the best known of Jesus' parables. It has become part of our very language. Even those unfamiliar with the Bible sometimes refer to such things as the Good Samaritan Laws. Note this from Wikipedia. Good Samaritan Laws offer legal protection to people who give reasonable assistance to those who are or who they believe to be injured, ill, in peril, or otherwise incapacitated. This is an oversimplification as laws vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And I'm not trying to give legal advice. The point here is that the term Good Samaritan is part of our language. The parable of the Good Samaritan was given when a lawyer approached Jesus and asked, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asked in return, What did he find in the law? 
The lawyer replied that one should love God with all his heart and love his neighbor as himself. He then asked, Who is my neighbor? It was at this point that Jesus spoke this important parable. He described a man who was beaten and robbed by thieves and left half dead. Two highly respected men among the Jews walked by and did nothing. Finally, a Samaritan, one lowly esteemed among the Jews, gave aid to the poor man, took him to an inn to recover, and paid all his expenses. Jesus then asked the critical question, Which of the three was neighbor to the one who fell among thieves? Even this self-justifying lawyer had to admit that it was a Samaritan. Is being your brother's keeper not also the message found in Philippians 2, verses 3 to 5, where the Apostle Paul instructs us, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The message of pop culture is love yourself. The message of the Bible is love God and love your neighbor. In the final segment of this program, we'll look at a tragic true life story of a man who didn't understand what it meant to love a woman. Failure to understand the true nature of love is not restricted to our age. The Bible relates a tragic story of a young man who never understood that true love was outgoing, not inward. It's a story of Amnon a son of King David, and Tamar, his half-sister. Either Amnon had never been taught what it means to love a woman, or he was a very poor student. Love to him was self-centered and worldly. Instead of love, it was lust. Let's read of this sad account in 2 Samuel, the 13th chapter. After this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Amnon was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick, for she was a virgin. And it was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. We are then told that Jonadab was a very crafty man, and he hatched up a plan for Amnon to be alone with Tamar and Amnon was only too eager to follow the advice of his cunning uncle. Then Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill, and when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let Tamar, my sister, come and make a couple of cakes for me in my sight, that I may eat from her hand. David should have suspected something was not right with such a request. But for whatever reason, he was fooled by Amnon's words and granted him his request. And David sent home to Tamar, saying, Now go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was lying down. Then she took flour and kneaded it, made cakes in his sight, and baked the cakes. And she took the pan and placed them out before him but he refused to eat. Then Amnon said, Have everyone go out from me. And they all went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the bedroom, that I may eat from your hand. We are not told whether Tamar had any reservations about this arrangement, but danger signs were all around. Why such an unusual request in the first place? Why was everyone else put out of the house? Why was she requested to feed him by hand alone in his bedroom? Clearly, there's a lesson here for all young women. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them to Amnon, her brother, in the bedroom. Now when she had brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come, lie with me, my sister. But she answered him, no, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing should be done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. However, he would not heed her voice, and being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. As tragic as this was, 
it got even worse for poor Tamar. As so often happens when a man seduces, or as in this case, rapes a woman and gains his desires, he then dumps her. Most often it's because what he is chasing is the thrill of conquest. But there are other reasons for dumping. And with Amnon, it appears he was afflicted with guilt, and rather than take responsibility for what he had done, he transferred the responsibility for what happened onto innocent Tamar. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Arise, be gone. So she said to him, No, indeed, this evil of sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. Then he called his servant who attended him and said, Here, put this woman out, away from me, and bolt the door behind her. One who truly loves someone will do nothing to harm the object of his love. Though Amnon professed love for Tamar, and perhaps as with so many young people he thought he loved her, his actions tell us a very different story. He was selfish and cruel. He lacked outgoing concern. For him, love was all about the way that he felt and what he wanted. Tamar's feelings and her well-being were not considered. This is not love. In the end, Amnon paid a price for his treachery. Two years later, Tamar's brother Absalom took revenge and it cost Amnon his life. Jesus summed up love in what is called the golden rule. It's recorded in Matthew 7, verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This is the message of the Bible. Treat others as you want to be treated. Be your brother's keeper. Put the needs of others before your own and learn how it is truly better to give than to receive. 